All right, so we can probably get started and let people trickle in um, if they need to. Um, my name is Chelsea DiGiuseppe. I am the marketing manager for UNH Innovation, so thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, our office hosts these monthly seminars on topics related to um, entrepreneurship and innovation. And our goal is to provide relevant information about those topics and also create opportunities for like-minded individuals to connect. Um, this year's seminar series, we have introduced an interview style format um, to help us explore the theme of innovating in New Hampshire. So this month's seminar topic is innovative UNH alumni. And our guest will discuss his career and how he has grown a successful business um, after leaving UNH. Um, uh, this will be followed by 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A, and then we invite you all to stay for some networking and appetizers. Um, I do have to remind everyone that um, you have to be 21 um, plus to partake in the alcohol. <laughs> Uh, so before I introduce the speakers today, I wanted to say thank you to our generous sponsors. Finch and Maloney, a law firm that provides intellectual property counseling and um, services to technology companies. It's located in Manchester, New Hampshire. And we also want to thank Divine Millimet for their gold sponsorship of the event. Divine is a full service law firm um, also in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, they have a small business team specifically for information and services related to um, starting and running a small business. Um, next month's seminar is our annual holiday uh, networking event on December 18th, so we invite you all to join us for that. There's not going to be a speaker, um, it's just a, a fun time to get together and um, enjoy good conversation, good food, and celebrate the holidays, and we always have a really good turnout for that. Um, so it's a good chance for networking. Um, and then finally, I would like to introduce um, the UNH Innovation team members that are here today. Um, we have Maria Emanuel, who is our Associate Director. We have Tim Willis in the back with the camera, who is uh, one of our Licensing Managers. And then Annie Schofield, who is our Program Support Assistant. Uh, and a couple of our other teammates couldn't make it here today. Um, now on to today's seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Joe McEachern. Um, Joe is a UNH alumnus with a master's degree in computer science. Um, while he was working on his master's degree, he worked at the UNH IOL. And there are a couple people from the IOL. Um, and um, after graduation, he entered the exciting um, tech industry of the 90s. Um, and then he worked at several startups in California before deciding it was time to create his own startup. And he founded QA Cafe in 2001, and QA Cafe is headquartered now in um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So tonight we have the chance to hear more about Joe's experiences in entrepreneurship and innovation and learn a little bit more about how he has grown QA Cafe from one employee himself um, to 14. 13. 13 and counting. <laughs> thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. Um, it's funny listening to that, because that when you read or hear someone's bio, it sounds like it's, it's like this plan that got executed and all these things. But you know, life happens all the way along there. But it you know, reads well when you, when you piece it together <laughs> like that. It cleans up nicely. Uh, well, why don't you start by describing your career path um, since UNH. Um, and how it has led you to QA Cafe. Well, sure. Uh, backing up before I actually landed at UNH, I was working down the road at Cabletron. Um, Cabletron in the 90s hired lots of people. I was one of them. And while I was there, I heard about this place called the Interoperability Lab. And I knew for me I was interested in going to grad school in, in computer science. Uh, I did an undergrad in electrical engineering, but really, was self-taught in terms of most of the programming, and I wanted to know what I was missing. So I was interested in UNH. I went down and met with the interoperability lab folks, and I was really hooked. It was, after just spending an hour down there, 
I knew that was a place for me. I just loved the concept. I loved uh, the access to all the equipment. I loved the people that I met down there. Um, so I was a convert right away and um, spent some time, quality time working at the IOL while I was attending UNH. And that really opened the door for me into the world of working for some startup companies. From there, I moved to California and worked um, at a startup. In fact, I was able to get a job at a trade show that I attended while I was at the IOL. Um, and so it was just a great time and great experience. And I did that for a few different startup companies. You know, you kind of chasing the carrot for a little while. And that really gave me um, the confidence to potentially do something myself. And I, I will say QA Cafe started out, it wasn't, my vision was not to create a startup, but more to create a consulting company um, where I would do work for other people, but under the QA Cafe uh, name. And the first product um, that we created, what it actually was was more of a proof of concept to say these are the kinds of things I could do for a company. And it just so happened that somebody wanted to buy the proof of concept, and that really kind of leapfrogged the beginning of QA Cafe. Um, could you, in layman's terms, uh, describe what QA Cafe is and does? Uh, sure. So our focus, we have a couple different products, but our main product deals with the router that you probably have in your house. So a device like this. And our product is a testing product, so it's used in labs by engineers uh, who either make devices like this or maybe service providers that uh, offer you internet service. And you effectively could test the functionality of this kind of device very quickly. And this was the kind of thing I did for a number of companies. And I would go into a company to set up some automation and work on testing network protocols. And so the, the unique thing about QA Cafe was taking those concepts and putting it into a product. So it's something you could then sell to a company that they could do it themselves. Um, so that's really it. I mean, today, really, you could name almost every device, especially any device available uh, here in the US. And more than likely, they are one of our customers. Um, or the chips inside of those devices. Uh, we work with the companies who make the chips. And we work with a lot of the major ISPs as well. So, if your internet connection at home isn't working, you either can blame us, or if it was working really well, you can, you can thank us but <laughs> for helping the small part. So how, how has the growth been um, in the company from the beginning product um, moving on to where it is today? Well, we, we, we're a bootstrapped company. We, we don't have outside um, funding. So we've kind of been able to grow as our sales have grown. But we have seen, since about 2008, really steady growth year over year, where companies become customers, and they come back to us, and they purchase more. They expand their testing. If they're starting a new group, um, maybe they'll buy some more of our testing setup. So we have seen pretty steady growth. And that growth has been able to allow us to hire more people and do more things. So it's kind of a, it's, I'm not going to call it a snowball, but there's that process as it grows enables us to do, to do more. Um, we've been able to launch an entirely new product a couple years ago called Cloud Shark, and that's really sort of like a company within a company for us where we've been able to fund that ourselves um, as we've developed it and as we've evolved it um, using the, the success of our CD router product. And you, you said that in, the, in your introduction that um, QA Cafe was originally going to be a consulting company. Um, can, you, can you take us through those months of, of trying to get that started and then um, coming up with your product instead? Um, sure. Well, I, I was putting things together to really demonstrate um, the type of work I could do for companies. And I did feel like this kind of device was just really coming into more mainstream um, this was right around, right around 2000, where you'd start to see uh, you could go into a store and buy a router for your house, where before that wasn't as common. Some people maybe did it themselves, um, but it became an actual consumer product. And I felt like that was a great application for my skill set. Previously, I would work on routers that you would find in a larger company, and these were much more expensive products. So I took that same kind of approach but for these lower end devices. 
And the process for me was trying to, I was so close to having what I felt might be like a finished, more finished product that I decided to go ahead and create some web pages around that and put it out there as a finished product. And lo and behold, uh, a company contacted me um, and wanted to purchase it. And that was really the beginning. I had no experience in sales. Um, some would argue I still have no experience in sales, but that's really how it started. And it really, from that initial experience, was able to really move forward. That's great. And I know something, a topic that's really important to a lot of our attendees um, is funding. And you mentioned that you were bootstrapped, but did you ever consider the VC route? Before QA Cafe started, I did team up with another colleague, and we did go around and do uh, some presentations to VCs in the Boston area. We had a concept for a company called Test Engines, and what's amazing about it is it was really vague. You know, it wasn't totally clear exactly what we we're going to be doing, but we had enough that we went forward and um, did some presentations on it. Um, one of the venture capitalist companies did some due diligence on us and had somebody sit down and talk to us about this space. And th their advice to us was, this sounds like a great business, sounds like an area that might be very successful, but it, it may not be something that's really attractive for venture funding because the uh, potential upside maybe isn't, isn't big enough. But you could do this as maybe a very successful company if you can find a way to do it. And so I always took those words to heart. Um, and that really was something that we did and just moved forward. And now we've kind of passed that threshold where I, I probably wouldn't go the other way, even though that might open up opportunities mm -hmm. uh, for things we can do. Uh, we've worked really hard to create a company that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, we've been in business now almost 14 years. And that sustainability is really attractive to me uh, versus a you know two to three year push where we either got to make it or break it. Yep. Um, when we had talked before, something interesting that you had said to me was that 70% um, of your sales are international. Um, what are some of the challenges that you face in doing business overseas? Well, there are the obvious ones where time zone comes into mind, uh, language can be a challenge. Um, we're, we're lucky that a lot of the technology um, that we deal with, a lot of the standards, a lot of the focus is in English. It, we're able to deal with a lot of that. But there's the challenge of not really getting to know the customer that well before we're asking them to spend money on our products. And that can be challenging. Um, we don't have a sales force that can travel um, worldwide. So we do work with some distributors. And so you're going through a third party. Um, you sometimes lose that connection that you might be able to develop with uh, companies that are closer to home. Um, but I have to say, it's been a fun experience um, with today, with the internet, with things like GoToMeeting and the ability to share. Um, you know, we can, we can have a call with our, our distributors in, in Taiwan and you know, have some jokes and, and, and see them and, and QA Cafe t-shirts over there in Taipei and, and, and make some connections. And it uh, can be kind of surreal to, to see that we are doing business all the way around the world. Yeah. Um, well, what about protecting intellectual property? I know that can be a little hairy when it comes to overseas um, business. Um, are there any negatives? Um, what have you encountered? Well, our product is licensed, so we have a concept of a license where when you install it on a system, it should stay on that system. Uh, we made the choice long ago that rather than focus on that completely, we would do the best effort to stop the honest person really from installing it multiple times. But we know that anybody with the right skill set could easily go in and manipulate that system and run it in another way. Um, so we don't chase those types of things. We've heard reports of uh, our, our licensing getting, um, getting cracked, if you will. Um, but we've really been dealing with major companies that typically are on the up and up with us. And that sort of black market, they're never going to become customers anyways. Um, so we, we chose not to deal with it. The same with the, the sort of the patented um, approach 
Um, a lot of our software is built on top of open source that we leverage as well. Mm -hmm. And we've never pursued um, the, that sort of approach to licensing or protecting our, our IP either. Okay. Um, can you give us a little background as to how um, such a large majority of your sales are actually um, overseas? How did that come about? Well, I think you look at the reality of these types of products today, and they're inexpensive, um, there's not a lot of margins, and even for the companies that are U.S. companies, uh, a lot of the engineering, it's all moved overseas. So our tool that a group maybe in the U.S. was using, we've seen them move the entire group to another country, but take the same tools. So we're one of those tools, so we get to follow as well. So I think it's just the nature of the globalization today of a lot of this technology where a lot of the activity is done. Um, the U.S. actually ranks very low in like broadband speeds and capabilities because of the way our, our system works. Um, I think we're in, in, the, in the top somewhere after 20. But a lot of other countries are actually more advanced. They're actually pushing the envelope a little bit more in terms of the Internet that they offer to residential um, country. So we work a lot with the Nordic countries that are doing a lot, a lot of the ISPs and smaller uh, router vendors that you wouldn't have heard here that are doing a lot of innovative work. Okay. Speaking of innovating, our, our theme um, this year is um, innovating in New Hampshire. Um, so be besides the original CE router, what other innovations have helped QA grow and expand? Well, we've done a lot of work with the Interoperability Lab. Um, there's one protocol in particular from the broadband form that has been a very successful for us. Um, it's called TR69 or CWMP. Um, but we, we've become kind of one of the few test companies involved with that protocol. And the IOL did a lot of work with that protocol as well. In fact, um, they have a certification program that they run for the broadband form. And we have a licensing agreement with the IOL to make that, um, the tools that they developed at the IOL available through us to third parties. Um, so that's been one of the things where it's extended our, our presence in the testing world and it's helped us to gain notoriety. Great. Um, what has your employee growth been like since you founded the company and um, how do you go about finding the right talent? Well. Um, you know, we're, it's always challenging to find people who have the skill set we're looking for, but also are really passionate about the area that we're in. I mean, this topic of testing and testing these kind of devices, um, it's a very much a niche. Um, that's why it's, it's really re remarkable the, the interoperability lab being so close by to us. I mean, that's, we overlap with a lot of what's going on out there. And so they're perfect candidates for people to maybe work with us. And in fact, two thirds of our company actually are former IOL graduates. Um, and it's no, really no surprise. So um, it's been an interesting collection of people that have come and, and now work at QA Cafe. But that's, that's one of our main places where we look for people that want to continue to work in this space and maybe do it in this area. Do you participate in any internship programs? Or has that um, been found to be useful? Uh, we, we don't have interns in our, in our own company. We did try that at one time, and it wasn't successful for us. I think the, the short term um, of like a summer intern didn't, didn't bear out for us. Perhaps a longer term one would be something we would try in the future. Uh, we do tend to sponsor things. So like we have sponsored like the summer intern program at the IOL. And we do more of those types of things um, than having interns ourselves. Um, so you founded this company on your own. Uh, was there uh, a point where you were thinking about possibly taking on another partner? Um, was there a reason that you forged ahead by yourself? It's really just the way it worked out. And you know, if, if I had the opportunity um, with another partner, maybe things would have been differently. Um, but again, it's like just hearing the, the bio in the beginning, I didn't know how this was all going to play out when I was first starting. I just knew I wanted to do something. It was really focused on the idea, not the company. And so the, so the idea of the company 
really grew as we needed to, and we've been focused on the problem we're trying to solve and how to do that. So, you know, it's not a goal for us to hire a bunch of people just to hire them. It's really, if we need them to continue that vision of, of things we want to accomplish, then we'll continue to add, add people. But, you know, who knows what the future holds, and maybe the, in the future um, we'd have a different organization. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you decide what new products to develop? Well, today we're lucky we have a number of customers who tell us, mm -hmm. like, we would like this. And so that's once you have those relationships, it's incredibly valuable for them to give you that feedback. Um, that being said, it doesn't sometimes what they tell you maybe isn't a product idea. It's not something that easily fits in with your strategy or your product. So. Um, sometimes we look from our own collective experience and try to identify things. Um, as an example, our pro recently launched product, Cloud Shark, in recent meaning um, it's, it's much younger than our CD router product. It really grew out of our CD router product. It was some technology that we developed. And when we saw this ourselves, we, we identified that there was a much larger um, base of people that could use this and it's on its own. So we actually broke it out of our uh, CD router product and started branding it on its own. Um, now, do you seek out new customers or? All the time, All yeah. The time. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you go about doing that? Well, we, 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 we're very organic mm -hmm. in what we do. And I mean, you hear this concept today about you know marketing and inbound marketing and um, how to do that. Well, I mean, we put a lot of information out on the web about our products. Um, you can learn a lot about what we offer by just going to the web. And so through organic search, a lot of people find us. So most of our sales are based on inbound sales where people are searching uh, acronyms, protocol testing, things like that, and they stumble upon us and find us that way. Um, we've tried. We do some advertising. We do some Google ads. and. Um, Twitter promotions, stuff like that. But we find like the most effective uh, means for people to find us is really organic search. Like we try to put really helpful content out there and let the search engines kind of do their magic. Well, there's a lot of really um, big tech companies out there. How can you, how can QA be successful with that kind of competition? Well, uh, the market that we're going after for really, really big companies, they probably would view this as small, like the residential CPE testing space. If you look at like a lot of the testing companies, they make testing solutions that are multi-purpose or generalized. For example, uh, maybe we'll test IPv6, but we'll test IPv6 whether it's on a core internet router or on your phone or on anything, where our solutions really target specific devices and are more catered for uh, what's unique about those devices and those spaces. So largely we've been successful because the larger companies don't specialize um, and they can't offer the level of customization and support that we can um, by doing that specializing. Great. Um, are there any failures that you've had along the way that you're willing to, uh, to share with us? <laughs> and had, have they become new opportunities? Yeah, we, we've had a few. You know, there, were, there was an early product um, that we had that we never sold. Um, and we've had other things all, along the way uh, we haven't been able to sell. Um, in fact, we had one product where we finally had the opportunity, finally had a customer that was going to purchase and decided, you know, does it really make sense? It's been such a struggle to, do we want to just have one customer for this product and who knows where that would go? So we actually made the, the, the decision not to sell it and to sort of recycle some of the technology because we kind of gone, we had taken it through a vetting process and it just didn't, didn't make sense. So when we have something that is working, we try to do more of that. And we have recycled things, and that learning experience or some of that newer technology can maybe help us in other ways. But not everything we've done has, has worked out. I think that's, um, I think that's just mm -hmm. how it goes. Yeah. Are there any other challenges that you've, you've faced since 2001? Well, you know, we're always trying to keep up with the, the latest technology. That itself presents a big challenge. Um, there's a lot of 
Um, and we're trying to keep up with it at, a, at low levels in terms of you look at the number of standards and standards bodies that are out there, and that governs a lot of our, our, our products. And it's, it's huge. I mean, when, when we first started, look at like uh, the, um, the IETF and look at the, um, the RFCs, and RFC is a, is a document that helps to standardize a particular aspect of networking technology, particularly, usually. There might have been a couple thousand RFCs, and, and now there's, there's, there's many, it's quadrupled in terms of the, the technology um, life cycle that you gotta look at. So just keeping up with that is, is a growing challenge. Um, how, how, how have you landed in, in New Hampshire? And was QA Cafe founded in New Hampshire, or did you, did you migrate here? Well, I am from the Seacoast area. I actually grew up in, in Kittery, uh, right over the river. And that was an area, I've always loved this area, so um, you know, just worked out that the, the company started when I was living down in Boston. It started right out of my bedroom and didn't really have the vision of exactly where it's going to be, but because we're a small company and we're able to sort of be a little bit um, virtualized, and at one point we in fact were, we didn't have an office, we just all worked out of our houses. We've grown to the point now where we have enough uh, equipment and sort of operations happening. Um, but this has just been a really great place uh, in Portsmouth, um, which is where we are now, um, to run a business because we were able to attract people that want to be in this area and see the benefits of the quality of life. And, um, you know, I have a, like a five minute commute. It's just um, a, great, a great place to be. Um, so you, you've succeeded and you've accomplished your goal and QA Cafe is, is going strong. Um, do you have any advice for someone who's looking to start their own um, small business? I, I would say the, the, one of the key key things is just starting, and I have a number of friends who will, are, are they're always coming up with ideas and they always say, oh, "I got this great idea for a company." And first, you have to make sure that, that that's truly what you want to do because it's it, it can be something that's gonna you're gonna spend maybe years doing this, and you got to make sure you're committed to it. But if you are, then just start, just do something, make a plan to take some first steps, you know. That first step might be, I'm just gonna get a notepad and I'm just gonna write out a few ideas or people I need to meet or some next steps. Um, for me too, another very uh, key aspect is I hired a business coach um, a few years ago. That made all the difference. For a bootstrapped kind of company, we don't have the, the formation of maybe a board of directors um, or it, and if you don't have outside investment people you're accountable to, you need to create these things. So you need people that can help you. You can bounce ideas. So I think working either with a business coach or possibly a mentor, it's a really valuable thing to help you through that process. Yeah. That's great advice. Well, um, those were actually all of my questions. Um, so I would love to open it up um, to the audience if you have any questions for John. <laughs> How yes. do you price your products? How do you, how do you price a product like that, where you're looking at 10,000 10, technology uh, uh, revisions and, and having some mistakes, but having one uh, that succeeds like that? Well, that's a, that's a, we've evolved our pricing strategy over time as we've learned about more about what customers are willing to pay for our product. When we first, our, our product is about 10 times more expensive today than it was when we first started. Um, we were able, because I priced the product when I first started, and you're like, hey, if I can get anybody to buy this, it just seems fantastic. <laughs> but then you realize well, if you're gonna have 14 employees and you're gonna have ongoing development and you're gonna have all these other costs associated with it, uh, it's, it's a different pricing model. And we also sell to very, it's, a, it's very specialized software. There's a limited number of people in the world who would even consider buying this. So that, that changes the model completely too. So it's a longer sales cycle. We sometimes talk to companies for an entire year um, before maybe they'll purchase. They have to assign resources to use our product and become experts in our product. So it's an investment on their side. But once they do invest in our product, um, you know, there's a good likelihood that they'll be a long-term customer. 
some of our customers we've had for over 10 years now. And it's a strong relationship as, as they grow and change, we try to help with that process. You kind of mentioned a little bit about your hiring process and how you kind of target people that are excited about the niche field, right? Um, anything else that's helped you or, or you found hasn't worked for you in hiring? Well, the generic process of place an ad and get a candidate, it's a, that's a tough one. The most successful people, the hires we've had in our company are ones that have come in through uh, a connection, uh, networking. Um, somebody says, hey, my friend, I know about this guy. You know, that, that has been the way we've been able to find people. Because what happens is they, they have a connection too. So it's, they, they know something about you. They know a little bit more of, um, about your company. It's hard if, you, if you've never heard of QA Cafe and you're applying for a job, you know, from the outside world, we just are another company. And you have to do your due diligence and figure out who are these guys. So if we can start ahead of that, or you know, you know Bill, who's worked at our company or something like that, that helps, that helps a lot. Um, and so those have been our, our, our most successful um, employees. And if you work at the IOL, then you've always, you've, you've been a good fit, so. Have you had turnover and things that, <clears throat> once you hire somebody, they stay hired? <laughs> you know, we've never actually had anybody leave okay. on their own. <laughs> it's, I can't, it's, you know, it doesn't always work out, but um, we've had, you know, I've never had anybody tell me, Joe, I'm, not, we're, I'm done, I'm moving on. Uh, that day will come, but um, it's not something I spend my days thinking about, you know. Hey, and you had mentioned earlier, too, that um, one of the challenges of hiring is that you were saying all the secret sauce is, is in your head, and it's hard to... Um, the Instill onboarding that, is hard, yeah. yeah. I mean, one person changes our company, the dynamics. I mean, we're small, we, you know, heavily engineering. And you, you know, when you're on a team, it's, it's, you know, somebody was describing it the other day. It's like, we have a starting five. And like, if somebody's not there that day, it's, you know, something's not quite right. And like, in, in a small company too, you have almost no redundancy. Mm -hmm. So you got all these little experts in their own areas. If they're not available or some, they're, they can't be there that day. It might be something gets blocked on, on that. And that's one of the challenges in a small company is that redundancy piece. It's not like you can just swap in people in and out. Uh, the training and the onboarding are difficult. You just have to be there and you have to absorb and learn. Uh, we don't have a, as much written down as we should. We get, we've gotten better at that. Um, but I know I don't work that way, so it's been great to watch like engineering processes get established without me um, and somebody say, who wrote some of this code and, and, and prove it and, and better the product. That's great. Just piggybacking on that, do you have a target size? Uh, w w I love our size right now and I, I, w I wish we could kind of freeze our company, but you know, as, as your sales grow, as your product grows and things change, you're kind of forced um, to deal with like the stressors that that crop up. Like, we're going to need more support people. We're going to need somebody to learn this other technology, um, and so you do. You're kind of forced down that that road um, of growth. But you know, at some point, we'll, if we got too big, we're going to need people with different skill sets. Um, you, you need to, if you hire more people, you need to hire somebody to manage those people, and then somebody to manage that person, and. Um, you know, my, my forte has always been working with the small teams. And so, um, you know, we, we might grow a little bit, but there's no, there's no goal size. I, it won't be a 1,000, I'll tell you that. Um, you mentioned you build a lot on top of open source and stuff like that. Do you do any, like, consideration or due diligence about, like, what the license is of the open source thing that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, we. You start using it. Yeah, we do. Organic. No, we do. We look at what the impact is, and like as an example, we're working on a project now where we evaluated a few different tools and looked at the, the trade-offs of, of what that is. So you like selected stuff. Is there an open source license you like better than others, or? Well, the you know BSD or or um, MIT licenses that seem to be more open to 
um, software projects. Um, and I know that I, I'm not a licensed expert. There's, there's many variants um, today, but um, you know, the, the, like the GNU licenses are, can be problematic for, for, for people, even though there's lots of stuff out there. You mentioned uh, inboard marketing, uh, inbound marketing, and I just wonder if you would use any of the, uh, you know, companies, tools that, uh, you know, companies that exist, they offer tools for uh, optimizing that. Uh, we don't use any um, commercial inbound marketing tools. We have a f we do have a few tools that help us track our, our website. We have our some homegrown inbound things where we track uh, trials and people coming in to us. So a lot of the things we use are homegrown, but where we're the number of leads that we're dealing with is a, is a probably a smaller one than maybe some of the targeting uh, for some of these products. Uh, we, we've been kind of grown our own. Um, as we've gone forward. If you're doing international work, what are you using for legal support? Um, well, we have our licensing agreement. Um, you know, we, I, I wouldn't say we have a, a huge legal uh, channels that we go through. Um, the, biggest, the biggest challenge there is how, how do you get a, like a physical product into some of these countries? And so we have experience with that now, like how do you ship something to China? How do you get it into India? In a couple of these countries, there's some tax implications on, on uh, you know, what to do. A couple times, we've had some tax issues where we've had to just kind of leave it. And rather than, for the price points we're talking about, rather to, to engage, um, you know, it just didn't make sense uh, for us. So and there's more, more in terms of contracts for some of your support work that you might be doing that's te more technical in nature. Yeah, well, we, we have our, a general um, end user agreement. More often, the larger companies come back to us with changes that they want written in in order to proceed. And most of the time, we just accommodate them. It's not, as a small company, we don't get, tr we try to avoid getting tangled up in, in contractual things along that line. kind of piggyback on that question. Um, what's it like working with uh, a retailer rather than selling to the customer directly? Uh, a, a distributor type yeah, of company? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, well, I mean, they can be, they can be a great ally in, in helping you get your product into other places. Paralink, who's been one of our uh, distributors in, in Taiwan, I mean, they opened a lot of doors for us early on and helped us gain relationships with um, companies both in Taiwan and in China. Um, so, and in, in, in really in the beginning, they really kind of steered us through like, this is how to operate, and this is how to do it, and gave us some really good feedback. So really it was very valuable uh, in the beginning to educate us on how, how this is done. So uh, given the large percentage of international sales, uh, two questions. Do you uh, see the need to travel to Taiwan, to China, to visit your customers? And um, have you ever considered having uh, a presence there, that your company having uh, an office in Taipei or Beijing or wherever? Yeah, we've, we've tossed that idea around. Um, but we feel like we've been very effective with selling via Go to meeting or online meetings, or you know, you can you can still make phone calls and and email and that communication. So uh, we haven't taken that next type of step. I mean, that would be a big organizational change to have um, a presence uh, in another country. So I think if we can continue to operate in the model where we're based here in Portsmouth, would would continue that and until we saw that there was really opportunities we really were missing. Um, we're lucky because we're sort of a unique product, and so there, we're not, it's not so much about competition as much as education. Um, similar question, I guess. Being a small team, you kind of mentioned you have like, the, you know, if somebody's not there for a day, it can be a challenge and stuff like that. Do you have a lot of your guys that do like work, you know, 
from home or how do you feel about like people working like remote for a day or, or you know, just being a small team like how does that impact yeah, no, uh, we, we, we've had that in the past. In fact, one of the engineers in our office who worked at home for 10 years recently decided he was done working from home and he's now working in the office. So he went, he went the other way. And so we're open to that. Yeah, we, you know, we, there's times all of us will work uh, remotely, um, but there's, there's a synergy in the office that, you know, you, that you really thrive on. And it's when sometimes it's, ideas get off the ground and people are excited and they're motivated and so it's nice to have the office uh, environment but yeah you don't have to be there all the time. Do you have a hierarchy? Are you pretty much flat? Do you have a brain trust? Uh, we, we have a, a, a core group of, of people that um, you know I rely on to help vet out what we're doing um, but we're, we are pretty flat. Um, we have a director of engineering um, and you know that's that's really the only kind of formal structure we have. And then people, you know, I, I play multiple roles with people where I might be their boss, but I might be their peer on a project, or I might be helping them with something. Um, so we're pretty flexible um, in that regard. You you sort of slid over the competitive aspect of things. What is the competitive landscape for a company like yours? So many. When you're benefiting from organic search, what else are they finding? And, uh, well, our, our biggest competitor is a company hiring somebody with a special skill set to just perform a lot of the tasks that maybe our product would do. Um, and saying, well, we're going to have to hire somebody anyways. Um, the alternative is for, for if a company adopts an attitude, or, or when you're talking about testing, some companies will say, you know, we're purchasing a lot of our software for another third party. We're not going to test it. We're going to assume it's been tested. And so some of the attitudes around product quality come into play and whether they would spend um, money on, a, on test tools. But largely, we're, 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 are, we're competing against doing nothing or competing against hiring people with special skills to do this testing. Less likely we, people come back to us and say, we're not buying CD router, we're going with company X. What do you see as your biggest like growth opportunity like going in the future? So, like, and if you don't want to talk about like specific stuff, just Yeah, no. Into, like, no, I mean or vendor or Yeah, we, we just launched a newer um, addition to our product that we called CD router live and it lets people test these kind of devices connected into a live network. And it's really geared towards service providers. So server for service providers are really probably a, a growth opportunity for us because there are uh, many more of those types of companies around the world um, than there are vendor companies. Because you keep seeing these products consolidate. You know, We work with one company, and then suddenly they're that company, and then they're consolidated again. And if they all were using our product, maybe they don't need so much of it. So. Um, but you know, as we, we've seen consolidation happen, the industry still keeps growing. So new companies come along who do need our services. So that's the, the trend has been more up, even with consolidation. Have there have there been any um, business resources? Um, could be state, could be other um, that you've taken advantage of in your time? Uh, we, we haven't, you know, it's even over the last couple of years, I, I've made more of a conscious effort to educate myself and um, put QA Cafe more on the map in terms of letting people know about us. You know, for the, the first several years we were in business, I mean, we were really, you know, focused on our niche and um, didn't really, we had the blinders on in terms of what we're doing. So learning more about the opportunities and business opportunities and um, networking, and that's really only coming into um, sort of where we are now and understanding how to continue to grow and maintain our business. Mm -hmm. What percentage of your time would you say you're doing business management versus engineering? Or maybe some third activity? Yeah, it's a great question because I'm happiest when I am getting a chance to work on engineering. Um, and it's been a growth for me to work more on management problems and 
um, or work on the more business side. But I would say um, today it's probably like two thirds business, one third engineering, which pains me. <laughs> but um, you know, I, it's there are times when I probably should hand off a, a project to somebody else. But I, I maybe want I just want I have a natural curiosity to want to work on something, and so. Um, you know, I'm lucky now that I, I have a team that I can bring an idea and pull some resources in and maybe have them vet it out a little further and maybe I'll get involved um, again at some point. How often are you talking to your business coach? Uh, that format works um, probably, it's, it's almost weekly, you know, but it's not every week, but uh, quite a bit. <laughs> And what sort of what sort of issues are you discussing with them? Well, biz, business coaching is. The, uh, I work uh, with Paul McCaskill at Compass Point, and um, he's not trying to solve all my problems, but helping me get clear on uh, what what are the root issues. Um, a lot of times, you know, you're talking um, with challenges. You know, you, you you can just you can make assumptions. You can get bogged down by your own reaction to problems and. You know, coaching really just helps you kind of cut through a lot of that and get clear on uh, what, what is the real issue. And I, I, I find that's been incredibly valuable. Yeah, it sounds like a, a valuable resource, yeah, especially uh, as a team of one. Yeah, it, it, exactly. You, you, need, um, you need some guidance. Yeah, great. So Joe, is, is everybody an engineer or do you have any kind of business support staff at 13 people? Well, we have two full-time salespeople. And, you know, they, they're salespeople, but they, you know, they're, they're jack of all trades, you know. So one day, maybe it's not really a sales thing, it's more of a business development. In, in another company, it, it might be a little more structured like that, where they would do it all. Um, so those are the primary um, you know, business-related people. We, and we have some support um, staff that would help Across the board as well, um, but that you know that's it's it's heavy heavy on the engineering itself. Well, thanks for listening to me. I hope it was interesting for you. And <laughs> thank you um, so much. I, uh, we appreciate you coming by. Uh, can we just get a round of applause for Joe. <laughs> Joe will be sticking around for the networking portion, so if you have some more questions for him, just uh, come on up. He's pretty friendly. Um, yeah, uh, so help yourself to uh, the refreshments and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you.